So, hi, uh, my name is Amber Ng, and I work for the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Today, I'm going to be talking about a checklist of aquatic vascular plants for the Laurentian Great Lakes. As you might be able to guess for this session that I'm in, this project comes with a little bit of a backstory. So back in 2002, Noah Glural and the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network worked together to create the Great Lakes Water Life Gallery. It was a photo gallery, and I'll click through a few screenshots of what that website used to look like. Um, it included um, photos mainly was what it started out as, but then as time went on, it grew to include resources from state and regional uh, locations about the various fauna and, and flora of the Great Lakes. Um, it grew to include uh, fish, benthic invertebrates, zooplankton, algae, and eventually had over 1,700 photos available. It had a lot, of, a lot of different ways you could explore the data. It's a very nice website. But in 2016, NOAA came up with some um, accessibility standards for their websites, which this website no longer met. So it either needed to be reprogrammed from scratch or taken down entirely. So put a pin in that, and we'll move on to over at the EPA in 2014. Annette Trebetz and her team were working through um, DNA barcoding. They wondered what proportion of the fauna of the Great Lakes had a DNA barcode available to be able to um, test if they were doing eDNA, what proportion might be detectable. And they discovered that this was a really hard question to answer because there wasn't one comprehensive list of all of the Great Lakes fauna. So they worked to put together such a list. Um, they published a preliminary list in 2015. And then in 2016, when the uh, Great Lakes Gallery website had to be taken down, Rochelle Sturtevant and her team zipped it all up and sent it off to the EPA as the basis for a larger um, checklist of Great Lakes fauna. So they uh, at the EPA used that as one of their sources for creating a reference inventory for aquatic fauna of the Rentian Great Lakes, which they published in 2019. In 2018, they took all of their data, their big database of, of fauna, and sent it back to Rochelle at NOAA. Um, with the help of Joe Smith from Siegler, in 2019, they were able to get the Great Lakes Water Life Gallery as it is today um, up on the internet. Um, in, in, before they got this, put up, uh, Rochelle put in the effort to add algae back into this fauna database because algae were a big part of the original photo gallery. So they followed all of the methods from the fauna team and added algae as well. And then in 2022, they were able to add, um, do a, a pretty big overhaul of all the benthic invertebrates because there had been a lot of changes in phylogenetics and um, they all needed new links updated. So uh, when you view the website today, you can explore it. You can search for, through a number of different parameters and you get a page that looks like this. You can also download this as a CSV, but on the website, you have a column of the species, a column of common names, and then uh, presence or absence data. So in the green is the five Great Lakes, the blue or gray is the um, uh, three connecting channels between the Great Lakes. And then that last section is five different potential habitats of interest, whether those species exist in those habitats. If you click on the info button, you get more info. Um, and that includes links to genetic data, taxonomic data, life history information. And then at the bottom there, you can see there are references for what is it that we're using to say that this species occurred in the Great Lakes. So from the title of my talk, you know that this is about vascular plants in the Great Lakes. Um, so this database so far is entirely lacking in vascular plants. So that's where myself and my coworkers at the Michigan Natural Features Inventory were brought on board the project to provide some taxonomic and vascular plant expertise. So our main goal was to add vascular plants to the current database as it is, but we also wanted to make this checklist available in a more standardized format and to summarize whatever trends we found in plants along the way. 
I'm going to talk about a couple of different challenges that we had with our data as we went along and the things that we used to solve those challenges. The first big challenge was data complexity. So just like the benthic invertebrates, plants have undergone extensive changes in uh, taxonomy in recent years with phylogenetic advances. And then there's also the question of what counts as a vascular plant in the Great Lakes. So this is a little bit of a flowchart of the taxa search and alignment process. You don't necessarily need to uh, read all the details there, but that was to help me keep track of what we were doing. So the first question of what counts as an aquatic plant in the Great Lakes? Well, this is the uh, water life database. So we really want to focus on things that are found in the water and in the Great Lakes. So to do that, we started with a coefficient of wetness, which is a value from negative five to five, which uh, describes how often that species is found in a wetland. So a negative five is almost entirely found in wetlands. A zero is about 50-50, and a, a five is almost always found in an upland area. So to be water life, we decided to focus only on plants that had a coefficient of wetness from negative five to zero. Uh, flip the page in my notes. Um, the next step was to deduplicate our lists. So we got lists of these coefficients of wetness from all the states and provinces surrounding the Great Lakes. But then, of course, they're going to have a bunch of the same species listed twice. So deduplicating that list was a big part of our process. We also needed to determine what we were going to call a species in our list. What was going to count as something in our checklist versus being a synonym for something else as we went through the taxonomy. We were able to do a lot of that algorithmically, comparing um, existing taxonomic databases and seeing where they agreed. But where there was a disagreement, we looked at each individual species by hand and determined what we thought was the best way of treating that name. Next, we filtered things geographically. Uh, so those lists included everything from the very north of Ontario and the very south of Indiana and everywhere in between. So we wanted to filter out the things that we were very unlikely to see um, in the Great Lakes themselves. Um, and then the last step sort of in parentheses is adding back in things that we filtered out that shouldn't have been geographically filtered out just because of the way we did it. So that was our taxa search and alignment. The next big data challenge was data availability. We thought at first that we might be able to take a bunch of different field guides and combine them all together, and boom, we'd have our list. And that proved uh, not to be the case, because field guides talk about where plants are in terms of land area. So north from here, south to there, east from this state, west to that one. And that doesn't actually tell you if the plant exists in one of the Great Lakes or not. And we wanted this database to be very specific to the Great Lakes themselves. So what did we do instead? Um, we had a number of different data sources and we're still working all the way through them. But the first were uh, reliable human observations from two long running data sets. So we have the Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program and they provided us with all of their vascular plant survey data and um, the natural heritage programs through NatureServe. We got information on rare plants from them. The next step was to go through preserved specimens. That's a pretty good record that that plant was found in, in one of the Great Lakes if we have a physical specimen that says it was. So we downloaded biodiversity data from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, and from Symbiota, which is a portal for accessing herbarium specimens. And then our final step is going through individual government reports, book chapters, uh, journal articles, things that might have created a species list from a particular survey of a particular location in one of the Great Lakes. Two great resources for that have been the Great Lakes Botanist and the Journal of Great Lakes Research, but a number of others as well. Our last data challenge is the idea of structure. So how are we keeping track of all of this data? Because there's a lot of it. One way of sharing biodiversity is, data is through a Darwin Core archive. Darwin Core is a standard for uh, describing data, and a Darwin Core archive is a bunch of CSV files and a bunch of metadata all zipped together and in a downloadable chunk that you can pass around. Theoretically, everyone should be able to use because it's all the same Darwin Core format. 
But we also have the current Great Lakes Water Life website, which is great, but it is more in the format of like a single spreadsheet, a CSV file. So Darwin Core archives have a bunch of benefits. They are standardized and they can be um, interchangeable. So if somebody has a process that uses a checklist in a Darwin Core archive format, they can use our checklist. Um, they can also be added to GBIF, that Global Biodiversity Information Facility, so somebody can access the checklist there. And finally, they're publicly versioned, so if we make a change, someone can still access the past versions and see what it is that we've changed. But the Great Lakes Water Life website is awesome. It's already in place. We have the autonomy to change it if we need to, to shape it to our needs. And it's super easy to understand. If a person just wants a checklist from a very specific area, just one lake, one kind of species, or one, one set of taxa, like only the amphibians from Lake Erie, they can get that really easily. So we want to do both of these things. And how do we do that? We went with a relational database. If you're not familiar with a relational database, it's essentially a bunch of spreadsheets, but where you would be writing down the same piece of information twice, instead you write that in a separate spreadsheet and then connect them back together again. So this is a simplified schema of what our relational database looks like. We implemented it in Access. Um, and the, send, the really key piece here is that sender table, the taxon table. That is our checklist. That's the list of species and the information re related to each of those species, like the links to other information. And then you also have the synonyms table. So anything we determined was a synonym of something else goes in that synonyms table and points back to the taxon that we've accepted. You also have the references table. So all of the preserved specimens, all of the journal articles, those get listed there so that we're keeping track of where our data is coming from. And then you have your water body occurrences table. So that connects those references back to the individual species that they are evidence of. So that's all of our data, all of our background. What have we found? This is still preliminary. We're still working on it. We've got a lot of data to add to this database. But so far, we have 896 species or subspecies represented in the five Great Lakes. Um, that comes from 349 genera, 120 families, four or 47 orders, and four classes. Um, this represents about a 19% increase in the size of the Great Lakes water life database. Um, as far as what was highly represented, no big surprises there. Um, Poales, Asterales, and Lamiales are all very large orders, so it makes sense that they'd be highly represented. And then the Elistomales is what you're thinking of if you think of an aquatic plant, like your uh, um, pond weeds, frog bit, arrow grass, things like that. It's an, a mainly aquatic order, so it makes sense also that it would be highly represented. So I said that there were 896 species across all five Great Lakes. The dark green at the bottom here is the species that are in all of the Great Lakes, and that is 188 species were found in all of them. At the top, you can see species that were found only in one of the Great Lakes, and put together that is 215 different species. Things you might notice from this graph include Lake Michigan is very species, um, and that again kind of makes sense. Um, it spans the most distance, um, latitudinally speaking. So, two climatic zones, more variation in habitat types, so more possible variation in species. Um, you might also notice Lake Erie has a very large percentage that are only found in Lake Erie. We haven't actually looked at which species are making up that big chunk. Um, but one potential reason this might be happening is Lake Erie is warmer than the other lakes further south. So things that might survive there might not survive elsewhere. And then the last thing I want you to notice from this graph that might have already stood out to you is Lake Ontario has a very small number of species compared to the others. Um, at first we thought maybe this was a um, error or a bias in our data collection. And so we're keeping an eye out for that as we continue adding things to the database. But also it seems like it might be logical given that Lake Ontario is the smallest when it comes to surface area and uh, shoreline. So that's where the plants are. Um, so if it has the smallest area for there to be plants, 
the smallest number of plants might also follow. But we wanted to compare these lakes a little bit more in terms of uh, like pairwise comparisons. So we calculated Whittaker's beta diversity. So in this image, the size of the circle is the species richness of each of the Great Lakes. And the width of the line connecting the circles represents how similar they are. So a thicker line, more similar. With Whittaker's beta diversity, a number closer to one means they're more similar, and a number closer to two means they're more different. So the most similar lakes here was Michigan and Huron, which makes sense. Sometimes they're even treated as one lake because they're connected by the Straits of Mackinac rather than a channel like the other lakes. Um, the next most similar comparisons there were Lake Superior and Lake Michigan and Lake Superior and Lake Huron, which again, seems pretty logical. And then the last thing I wanted to pull out here was the biggest differences were between Lake Superior and Lakes Ontario and Erie. Yeah. They're opposite ends of the system. They have very different um, inputs, very different uh, sediment types, lots of different uh, abiotic environmental factors that might make these lakes different and therefore make their species composition different as well. And then the last thing that we've analyzed so far has been the uh, percent of the species that are introduced to that Great Lake. Uh, so you can see in this image, the yellow at the bottom, Lake Ontario has the highest percent at 12% introduced species, whereas um, Lake Superior has the smallest percentage at only 5%. Um, again, they're opposite ends of the system um, and very different inputs, very different um, uh, influences around those lakes, different vectors, different possibilities for establishment. So nothing too surprising there either. So what are our next steps? Like I said, we're still working our way through all of the data entry. We still have to go through a lot of preserved specimens and confirm their locations before we can add them to the database. And then we've also collected, but not yet put in the database, various journal articles, book chapters, and reports. After we've got all the data in, we need to do some web scraping to get all those taxonomic, genetic, and life history links. Um, and then we're going to collect photographs. So this started out as a gallery, and we want to keep it that way. So we're looking for to have a photograph of every species we're including. So if you have any great photos of vascular plant species in the Great Lakes, I would love for you to send them to me, and we can include them on the website. And then the last step is going to be the, the export from our relational database where we've been keeping everything into the Great Lakes Water Life website and the Darwin Core Archive formats. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Amber. Are there any questions? Are you using iNaturalist at all to collect photos? Because I know a lot of like NHIC records from Ontario are listed on there, at least from some of the old botanists in the region. Yes, we are definitely going to look at iNaturalist for photos when we get to that step in the project. <laughs>